To live with an open heart is to live in a perpetual state of adventure. This quote is by poet and author Richard Rudd and perfectly lobs up the gift state of today's shadow work submission. I'm Jessica DePazzi, and for the next at least 54 shows, I'm going to take you through this series that covers the spectrum of negative patterns in the human experience. Hi, everyone. I hope your summer has been relaxing and recharging and that you're making time for fun and play. And if you're not, maybe you're feeling stuck because you're literally stuck due to closed borders or whatever kind of limitations that we are experiencing right now. Um, If that's you, then today's shadow work submission will be an awesome one for you to play around with. Today, we're going to discuss the shadow of hunger. It's what possesses us with the urge to fill ourselves up with all kinds of substances and experiences without any real thought to the consequences in order to raise our serotonin levels. If you're not familiar with serotonin, it's sometimes called the happy chemical because it's a neurotransmitter that contributes to the feeling of well-being, happiness, and it's a mood stabilizer. And every time you fill yourself up, you naturally start to slowly feel empty again. And then you start the cycle all over again, either by disappointingly inviting that external stimulus back into your life or blaming that external stimulus for not giving you the lasting happiness that you were seeking And then you move on to another attempt in a different way. Another word for hunger that feels less manageable but is more common is addiction. And this can be an addiction to all kinds of things. Drugs and alcohol are the most demonized versions. But you can also be addicted to certain types of people or shopping or fighting or even traveling. Anything that gives you that serotonin hit you're craving, you feel like you're deficient in. And at this point, you might be wondering why we have this innate hunger built into us. According to the Gene Keys, the the classic translation of this 35th hexagram from the I Ching is called progress, because this shadow does a really great job of encouraging us to explore and invent and seek outside of ourselves. But it also has us developing our outside world at the expense of our inner worlds when we're living in our shadow and progressing as an attempt to cure our unhappiness. It's why sometimes you might look around at the world and the systems we've created and be like, WTF, how did this all happen? We have so many things at our fingertips, things are, that are so easily accessible for us today that try to fill that void as quickly as possible. Like really easy one-click purchases, two-day deliveries, ready-made meals, every show you could ever possibly want to watch, you get the picture. And it's not like those things are bad or evil. They're just our attempts to band-aid the friction in our lives that can only really be healed from a human level. Now, before I move on, a friendly reminder, I'm not a counselor or a psychiatrist or a physician, so please take all of this for your own contemplation and self-study simply with an open and curious mind. I'm not making any claims to be able to treat addiction with the shadow work process, But I also wouldn't be putting this submission together if I didn't think it could help a little bit. So, um, yeah, let's get started. The shadow of hunger is really interesting. It can show up in big, public, intervention-worthy ways, or it can be secretive under the surface and uh, secretive to other people, but also to yourself. A lot of us aren't even aware of all the substances and the external stimuli we're addicted to. And it may or may not be a problem for you. It's just good to be aware of the patterns so that you can make choices about them. On the shame or oppressive side of the spectrum, you are showing up as bored. These are people who are subconsciously or consciously afraid of what their life will become if they allow that innate hunger to bubble up to the surface. So they shove it back down. And then by doing that, they have these larger waves of temptation seemingly at random that pop up after which they feel really ashamed about. And because it takes so much energetic force to shove all that stuff back in, these people tend to lose their vitality and lose that zest for life and become unadventurous and sort of empty. On the blame or reactive side of the spectrum, you show up as manic. This is your typical way that you might see addictive patterns happening or somebody that has this reactive addictive patterns. Um, You're afraid of confronting the emptiness and the unhappiness or the lonely feelings that you fill your life up with external stimuli. And like I had mentioned before, you can either move from 
flower to flower or person to person, pizza to pasta, Netflix show to Amazon, keto to cool sculpting, whatever it is in kind of like a lustful frenzy, never really finding what will bring you happiness. Or you can stick to one type of external stimuli in a cyclical frenzy that also never really helps you find lasting joy or well-being. The second one is the one that's more obvious when we think of addictive patterns, but the first one is just as important. The reactive hunger person is driven by this deep urge to escape his past or her present, and they're looking for this perfect place or this perfect person, this perfect activity to fulfill their dreams. And as Richard Rudd says, in wishing for such a state, these people really miss the real gold, which is the adventure itself. So what do we do about it? On a biological level, the shadow of hunger is associated with the amino acid tryptophan. And I mean, tryptophan is a thing that we all used to say, like when you ate a turkey, you would go to sleep because there's all this tryptophan in it. Turns out that's not accurate, but... Anyway, that's another story. Tryptophan is a precursor in the biosynthesis of serotonin. So to over, oversimplify this, because a bio lesson isn't really the point here, and also I'm definitely not the first person you'd want to get a bio lesson from, you could say that producing more tryptophan, like in a healthy, reasonable amount, is good for the production of serotonin. But there are a few problems with tryptophan production. According to Jack Cruz, Dr. Jack Cruz, Tryptophan is the least common amino acid in our diets, and it also happens to be the most difficult to absorb in our brains. This, among other things, complicates the serotonin production. Um, Tryptophan is found in fish, poultry, like turkey, like I just mentioned, and dairy products, but eating these products doesn't necessarily increase your serotonin levels because other foods compete with tryptophan for absorption in your gut. It has to compete with other amino acids. It's like the skinny kid who's actually a genius on the playground who gets picked last when choosing teams. And it does make sense that fulfillment and the sense of well-being is lower on your body's priority list in terms of survival and why now that we live in a time where survival for most of us isn't something we have to worry about, it's a common shadow for us. So I would say that healing your gut brain is a great place to start. Learn about the benefits of probiotics and learn about making friends with your microbiome in more natural ways. There are tons of resources on the internet that can help you with that. And the next funny thing about tryptophan is that it's one of only two amino acids that's coded by only one codon. It's neither a start or a stop codon, and it's both ketogenic and glucogenic, meaning it can turn into either ketogenic bodies or glucose. And the way that it's triggered to be either ketogenic or glucogenic is by the sun. You may have listened to a bonus episode that I posted a while back where I talked about sunlight. Most of that research was also from Dr. Jack Cruz, who's the leader in mitochondrial education at the moment, and he's a total sunlight nut. Anyway, tryptophan has a unique light absorption spectrum that he says hints that it's a seasonal time crystal. And now we get into time crystals. (laughs) The rabbit hole on this topic is deep and so confusing. I went from reading direct research and quickly tapped out of that when my eyes started to cross. Um, I went from that to Dr. Jack's Patreon, which offered me no less eye-crossing moments. And then I found a Vice article called WTFR Time Crystals, which I assumed was translated like for somebody like me. (laughs) Um, But I felt like Michael Scott from The Office asking his accountant to break down what a surplus was like he was five. It's like, okay, now explain this to me like I'm four because I'm still not getting it. Anyway, all that to say, I finally landed on a six minute YouTube video that I'll post in the show notes from Joe Scott for any of you who are curious as to what this new discovery on time crystals is all about. No, I still don't get it, but I do think it's important. It's one of these words that stood out to me. And um, because all this information is all open source, everything that I'm sharing here really should be refined and improved. I'm going to take it to where I feel comfortable taking it. So if any of you listening want to take the baton from here and find more connections on anything that I'm talking about, please do. And then email me your findings. I would love, love, love to get a better understanding of all of this. Anyway, back to tryptophan in the sun. Simply put, 
you must get as much sunrise and sunset sunlight into your body and into your eyes as possible and enjoy more time outside in general. And I really can't stress this next bit enough. An inconvenient truth is we really have to reduce the amount of artificial light that we're exposed to in order to have healthy tryptophan production amongst other things. It has to do with mitochondria health and they're finding that your mitochondria health is the key factor in the regeneration of your body. So even if you spend a lot of time outdoors, don't kid yourself, the time you spend indoors with light bulbs on is undoing all of that great sun quality you gained. So try using candlelight lanterns and red lights after the sun goes down and wear blue blocking glasses when you're looking at a screen. Seriously, I know that is inconvenient, but I'm telling you, it's the only hard charging point I'm super committed to on this show. If you go on a light diet and avoid artificial light just for a week, you'll sleep better, you'll be in a better mood, and you will feel more human. Now, healing your gut brain and optimizing your light intake are a few great ways you can help this chemical imbalance get back to homeostasis, but a critical part of getting out of the shadow is to do the tough work, which is directly turning and facing your humanity and your hunger to see how helplessly you're being uh, held hostage by it. In our Body and Mind Self-Mastery course for men, which you can find at wayoftrials.com, one of the trials or challenges that we have there is a multi-day fast. And in that, you can see that whether you starve yourself or stuff yourself, you're never going to solve the problem with adding in additional stimuli or limiting it. And that pause moment, if you sit with it long enough, you can see how trapped you are by this chemistry. You can start that process of diving inward to start your own personal intervention. You don't have to do this fast. In fact, there's another way around that if that's just not your jam. But I will say that once you break through the hunger barrier around day two, you can really feel into your heart in a different way. And so the thing that really can break you out of the shadow state is feeling into your heart and accessing love. Now, I'm not talking about falling in love. Actually, when you have butterflies in your stomach from meeting somebody new, your dopamine levels increase, which gives you that extra thrill when you see your new person, but your serotonin levels actually drop, which cranks up that dial for desire. The kind of love that I'm talking about is of your own inner space and feeling into oneness that we're all connected. Feeling into oneness is less about logically coming to the conclusion that it's possible, but more of an inner knowing that can only be sensed when enough serotonin is produced in our bodies. And a strategy for feeling that love within ourselves is by practicing extreme presence with a child's heart. This is a very fun practice. So for just one hour a day or one day to start if you're up for the challenge, be extremely in the moment and extremely playful with how you experience the mundane. Try performing everyday tasks with intense curiosity and awareness, like you're a toddler in an adult's body. And like a child, give some of your love unconditionally. So here are a couple examples. When you're washing the dishes, observe in awe how soap can get the grease off a pan, or watch how the water swirls down the drain. Feel the brush in your hand and how the goopiness of gunky stuff feels on your skin. And if you find yourself wandering off thinking about, oh, I don't know, where your dish brush was made and how you're contributing to the child labor issue in China, just reel it back in. You can think about that stuff at another time. And if somebody interrupts you, awesome. Put everything down and be extremely present with them. Listen to the tonality of their voice and the expressions of their face when they're speaking to you. Maybe notice how nice their voice sounds or maybe notice how diligent they are in telling you this thing that they're explaining. At which point you can be unconditionally giving by telling them what you notice about them. Giving a little bit of your love. If you go to the grocery store, get super curious about who's ringing you up at the chick stand. Learn their name, notice something interesting and beautiful about them that you've never noticed before. And if you think it's appropriate, tell them that nice thing you noticed about them. All of this is a really simple way of finding adventure in your own reality. You turn it into your own personal fantasy. By doing this, you open up these wormholes into new worlds that you just sleepwalk through every single day. 
And so that's how we transform the shadow of hunger into adventure. It's like you use a method of homeopathy by going out and just testing the waters and feeling a little bit of excitement here and there, but for your own satisfaction, for your own curiosity. And just when you feel like you've hit the edge, you can reel it back in and you can go through another adventure. Another thing to consider about feeling adventure is that there's a little bit of fear associated with it. There may be fear uh, associated with you asking the grocery bagger his name for the first time after years of just not caring what it was, or that you appreciate him for always having a smile on his face because you don't know how he's going to react. In fact, we live in a time where in, when giving some of your love unconditionally, looking for nothing in return, literally short circuits other people's brains. It creates an abnormal aspect of their day, which they'll likely think about for days and weeks to come. And for some people, it might even trigger them to go even deeper into their own fear patterns, which in my opinion is still okay if you do it with integrity. You're not responsible for managing other people's emotions, especially if they're getting triggered by non-invasive kindness from a stranger. But you never know really where seeds are going to be planted and when and with who. I think this is one of the easiest and quickest ways to change your life for the better. You won't necessarily become the most successful with extreme presence. Um, you won't necessarily become the smartest or the funniest, but you will feel the most adventurous, even if you never leave your small town, because you have the power of opening up wormholes into other worlds with this type of strategy. Okay, so that is the shadow of hunger, which transforms into the gift of adventure. On the next shadow work library submission, I'm going to cover the shadow of selfishness and how it transforms into the gift of altruism. This is a really good one for any of you who are parents and specifically moms, I found, who are feeling like they're showing up too self-sacrificing or even feeling like they're too self-centered. And as always, if you have any questions about what I talked about today, you can email me at jessica at the special forces experience.com or hit me up on Instagram at Jessica. Depotsy. That's D E P A T I E underscore. Have a great week, everybody. Stay safe, but not too safe. And we will talk again soon.